Because Act 2, Scene 3 is 365 lines long, the analysis in this video will only go as far as Cassio and Rodrigo's entrance at line 130. The scene opens outside the guardroom. Enter Othello, Desdemona, Cassio and attendants. Othello gives Cassio orders that he is to oversee the watch tonight as he absolutely doesn't want the celebrations to get out of hand due to excessive drinking. Good Michael, look you to the guard tonight. Let's teach ourselves that honourable stop, not to outsport discretion. Note how Othello addresses Cassio as Good Michael. The fact that he uses his given name rather than his surname suggests a deep level of familiarity and friendship that is somewhat unexpected, given that Othello is speaking to him in an official capacity. This will make more sense, however, when we consider that Othello addresses him merely as Cassio when he takes his leave of him part way through the scene, marking as it does the successful completion of the first step of Iago's audacious plan to engineer Cassio's fall from grace and his estrangement from Othello. Note the dramatic irony here as Cassio implies that everything is bound to go smoothly as Iago hath direction what to do. Although he assures Othello that despite this, with my personal eye will I look to it. Othello, in another moment of dramatic irony, agrees that Iago is most honest, or reliable. Reassured that both Iago and Cassio will ensure that everyone drinks responsibly, Othello exits to finally consummate his marriage to Desdemona. Come, my dear love, the purchase is made, the fruits are to ensue. That profit's yet to come between me and you. Good night. Iago enters to be greeted by Cassio, who informs him that they need to get to work. Note how Iago immediately starts talking in prose, as he tells Cassio that they are not due on duty for another hour. Not this hour, Lieutenant. It is not yet ten of the clock. Our general cast us thus early for the love of his Desdemona, who let us not therefore blame. He hath not yet made wanton the night with her, and she is sport for Jove. Othello, he claims, just wanted to get rid of them early because he wants to have sex with his wife. He can't be blamed for this because he hasn't yet had the chance. Iago's description of her as sport for Jove, the king of the gods who was renowned for his sexual exploits, implies that Desdemona is eminently bedable. Note how in the back and forth of comments about Desdemona that ensues, Iago tries to lure Cassio into talking about her in a coarse way but exclusively focusing on how he reckons she is a bit of a live wire between the sheets and that she is very flirtatious. Cassio, however, refuses to be drawn, exclusively remarking on her beauty and purity. This is important because even in private he reveals that he doesn't have any dishonourable intentions whatsoever towards her, which is, of course, what Iago will go on to insinuate. She's a most exquisite lady, and I'll warrant her full of game. Indeed, she is a most fresh and delicate creature. What an eye she has, methinks it sounds a parley to provocation. An inviting eye, and yet methinks right modest. And when she speaks, is it not an alarm to love? She is indeed perfection. Iago abruptly changes the subject as he moves on to the next part of his plan, announcing that he has a jug of wine and that just outside there are a couple of young local men who wish to have a measure or to drink a toast to the health of the black Othello. Cassio, however, is reluctant as he admits that he can't handle his drink very well and wishes that courtesy would invent some other custom of entertainment. Iago tries to pressure him into having just the one, but Cassio confesses that he's already had one this evening and that was craftily qualified or diluted. Even so, he's already feeling a bit muzzy and he doesn't dare have any more. 
I am unfortunate in the infirmity and dare not task my weakness with any more. Iago presses the matter, exploiting the fact that Cassio is a stickler for good manners, by implying that if he doesn't, he will offend the locals. Cassio somewhat unenthusiastically goes to let them in. I'll do it, but it dislikes me. Iago is left alone and, reverting to blank verse in a soliloquy, fills us in on the plan. He has worked out that if he can get Cassio to drink just one more cup, that, in addition to what he's already drunk, should make him as full of quarrel and offence as my young mistress's dog. There is also the lovesick Rodrigo, whom love hath turned almost the wrong side out, who has drowned his sorrows with potations pottle deep, or tankards of alcohol, as well as three lads of Cyprus, noble swelling spirits that hold their honours in a wary distance. They are young and arrogant local men who are quick to take offence, who Iago has flustered with flowing cups or plied with drink. It is his intention to, now amongst this flock of drunkards, put our Cassio in some action that may offend the isle, or incite Cassio to some argument in the belief that a drunken brawl, for which Cassio will be held responsible, shall ensue. Cassio re-enters with Montano and some gentlemen, announcing that they have already pressed a large quantity of drink onto him. Montano disagrees, saying that it was only a small one, not past a pint. Iago gets the party going by singing a drinking song. Cassio's enthusiastic reception of it is evidence that he's getting steadily more inebriated. For God, an excellent song! Iago reveals that he learned it in England, where indeed they are most potent in potting. In other words, they are very heavy drinkers, who, he says, can drink Danes, Germans and the Dutch under the table. The only reason for including these comments would have been Shakespeare's desire to appeal to his English audience's rather dubious sense of national pride in their capacity for alcohol. Cassio is now an eager participant in the drinking as he freely proposes a toast to the health of our general. And Iago sings yet another English drinking song that Cassio judges to be a more exquisite song than the other. The extent of Cassio's drunkenness becomes clearer as he starts rambling about who will end up going to heaven and who won't. Well, God's above all and there be souls must be saved and there be souls must not be saved. Iago agrees and says that he hopes that he too will be one of the saved, which is quite ironic really, knowing what we know about his true intentions. Cassio, blissfully unaware that he has taken the job that Iago feels is rightfully his, and wittingly rubs it in that he is of a lower rank. Aye, but by your leave, not before me. The lieutenant is to be saved before the ancient. This has got to sting, and no doubt hardens his resolve even further. Cassio now remembers that he has a job to do, and is at great pains to assure everyone that he is not drunk. Do not think, gentlemen, I am drunk. This is my ancient. This is my right hand. And this is my left hand. I am not drunk now. I can stand well enough and I speak well enough. And he exits. Iago wastes no time in persuading Montano that Cassio has a serious drink problem. Note how he is careful to preface his negative comments with compliments about Cassio's skills as a soldier. But only we know to be insincere. To not arouse Montano's suspicions that he's being malicious. You see this fellow that is gone before. He is a soldier fit to stand by Caesar and give direction. His problems with alcohol, however, are as severe as his prowess as a soldier is great, and he fears that Othello's blind trust in him will put the island at risk of destruction. And do but see his vice. Tis to his virtue a just equinox, the one as long as the other. It is pity of him. I fear the trust Othello puts him in on some odd time of his infirmity will shake this island. Montano is shocked by what he's heard, especially when he's told that Cassio spends a couple of hours a night clock watching if he hasn't had any alcohol to lull him to sleep. It is evermore the prologue to his sleep. He'll watch the horologe a double set 
if drink rock not his cradle. Montano thinks that Othello should be made aware of this, suspecting that his good heart makes him inclined to only see the good in others while overlooking the bad. It were well the general were put in mind of it. Perhaps he sees it not, or his good nature prizes the virtue that appears in Cassio and looks not on his evils. Unnoticed by Montano, who is still focused on Cassio, Rodrigo enters. Iago, in an aside, sends him off after the lieutenant, presumably to provoke him into a quarrel. Montano thinks it is a shame that the noble Moor should hazard such a place as his own second with one of an ingraft infirmity, or that Othello should risk giving a position of such responsibility to someone with such a deep-rooted illness, and that the only honourable thing to do would be to tell him. Iago skilfully extricates himself from this responsibility, professing that he is not willing to do it personally because I do love Cassio well and would do much to cure him of this evil. He is rudely interrupted by a cry of help, help within, as it appears that Rodrigo has done his job extremely quickly. Not that it matters as he has already achieved his aim of laying the groundwork to enable Montano to unwittingly do his dirty work for him. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.